Hello guys and welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to show you how I prepared the solvents for the acetyl acetone synthesis. For That's going to be my next video. And I'm going to show you uh, the preparation of sodium ethoxide, which is the base catalyst for the acetyl acetone. Which was kind of a pain to make, but you'll see uh, later in the video. As always, I would love to give a huge thank you to my Templist Dollar patrons for helping out a lot. So first things first, we're going to be drying three different solvents. The first one's going to be ethanol, which was a pain to dry, I'll explain why later. Ethyl acetate, which was much easier, and acetone, which again was much easier. So here, ugh, I bought myself some denatured alcohol, but it's only denatured with uh, denatonium benzoate. So that'll be very easy to remove through a, through a distillation or two. And uh, of course, I also need to get rid of all the water and everything else. So I have calcium carbide and calcium oxide, which will uh, help get rid of it. Even though this ethanol claimed to be 99 plus percent pure and dry, it was a very good idea that I went through the whole drying process because when doing the calcium carbide step, I found that it was not as dry as it claimed to be. So first things first, I added a bunch of excess calcium oxide and uh, I added that to around 500 milliliters of ethanol, which should be enough ethanol for the whole process. After stirring it for around an hour, I uh, proceeded with the distillation. Now I obviously could have gone longer, but since I was doing the calcium carbide step, I wasn't too worried. Speaking of the carbide step, it was now time to do the carbide step. So all I did was just add uh, a decent amount of uh, calcium carbide to the ethanol. I then let the calcium carbide sit in there till I felt it was okay, which I think was around two days. You can see in this video small bubbles coming off, which is the uh, water present in the ethanol getting destroyed. After the allotted time, it was time to distill the ethanol. So while the ethanol was distilling, I decided to start drying the ethyl acetate and acetone, and all I did for this was just add uh, sodium carbonate and hydrous to the acetone, and I did the same calcium oxide method for the ethyl acetate. Remember when I said that the ethanol was being really annoying? Well, this was the point that it occurred. No matter how many times I distilled the ethanol, insoluble particulate kept on coming over, which was the calcium oxide and hydroxides from the original drying steps. I didn't want to filter the ethanol because that would expose it to the air, and uh, that would make it wet again, and I'd have to redry it, which would just defeat the purpose. So, I tried a fractional distillation, another fractional distillation, and it still didn't want to get rid of the insoluble particulate. It kept coming over. So I asked around and somebody told me to uh, actually use a cotton plug in my fractioning column. So that's what I did and it worked a charm. However, there was still a bunch of acetylene in my ethanol because it was extremely soluble. So again, I asked around to figure out how to get rid of this acetylene and somebody gave me a paper on using anhydrous copper sulfate to get rid of the acetylene, and again, this ended up working very well. That entire time, I distilled the ethanol a total of six times, attempting to solve problems that I could have just fixed in one distillation, which was very annoying, but oh well, now I have pure ethanol. So as I was dealing with the really annoying ethanol, I was working on the ethyl acetate and acetone, and I finished drying those as I was, you know, finishing up the ethanol, so now I was done with all three of my solvents. Now it's time to move on to sodium ethoxide and diethyl ether. The reason why I need diethyl ether, and I actually do need a decent amount of it, is because of the uh, extraction process after the acetyl acetone synthesis. Now I had a little bit of diethyl ether left over from um, before I headed off to college, so I took that out, I had about a hundred milliliters, and I decided to test it for peroxide since at this point it was uh, around six months old. So when looking for peroxides, I'm going to be doing the potassium iodide test. This test is when I dissolve potassium iodide and dilute hydrochloric acid and add some diethyl ether to it. If there is not a major color change, that means that there are no peroxides present. However, if there is a major shift toward the color red slash purple, then that means that there are a lot of peroxides present. The reason why this redshift uh, happens in the presence of peroxides is due to the fact that these peroxides are able to oxidize potassium iodide fairly easily in an acidic medium. Here is what my test solution looks like. 
So yeah, obviously uh, there are a lot of peroxides present, which is really scary because of how uh, dangerous they are. So what I do is add potassium hydroxide and leave it in there for a few days to help decompose the peroxides and uh, get them out of the solution. In hindsight, I should have used an iron 2 compound like iron 2 sulfate because that would have actually completely destroyed the peroxides. Anyways, I just distilled some fresh ether and I now have that for the synthesis. So now with that done, I can finally move on to the sodium ethoxide. For this synthesis, we need extremely pure sodium ethoxide. So for extremely pure sodium ethoxide, I'm going to use my really pure ethanol, but I also need to have really pure sodium. So again, I'm going to thank Backyard Science 2000 for donating me the sodium. I have actually used this sodium for a lot of different syntheses, and thank you so much to him. I am definitely going to be using his sodium for this synthesis, as it has worked for everything for me in the past. Although I know this sodium is fairly pure, it does have an oxide layer on the outside since it's been sitting in my humid garage for the better part of a year. To get rid of this oxide layer, I can do one of two things. I can either cut it off, or I can follow what Niall Red did in his video and use mineral oil, which is what I'm going to do. The mineral oil strategy, although very messy, worked very well and gave me the pure sodium I needed. So here's what the globules looked like at the end, and from here I just poured them into cold mineral oil, which um, solidified them very quickly. Once I was ready to use the sodium, I took out these solidified beads and I quickly dried off the mineral oil and stuck them in the flask with an inert atmosphere so that they would not react and get another oxide layer. This process was slow, but it worked fairly well. Okay, so here's my setup. You can see the sodium down there. That's 16.6 grams, almost exactly a fourth of the uh, procedure that I'm following. Here's a... Uh, all the other stuff, this will reflux the ethanol because it's going to get really hot. This will drip the ethanol. And this, of course, is going to be ensuring that no dry or no water gets in. So this should be a good setup. I ended up adding around four to five times the amount of ethanol I actually needed for the sodium ethoxide synthesis. And this was so it would actually dissolve the sodium ethoxide so the uh, sodium could keep reacting. Once the reaction slowed a lot, I uh, started it in a reflux, and the reflux seemed to do the trick as it quickly dealt with the rest of the sodium. Now naturally, as the reaction was running, and it having to be extremely anhydrous, of course, a massive thunderstorm, the biggest one I've seen yet of the year, uh, decided to roll in right then. Of course it's a massive thunderstorm right now. Look at this. What is this? Going into the garage? I have to have it open though because the reaction is producing a lot of hydrogen. So I can't really be dealing with this right now. Even with the slight thunderstorm issue, the reaction proceeded to its finish and this is what the solution looks like. Notice how it's perfectly clear. So at this point I'm like, okay, cool. It's clear, it looks good, I did it successfully. So I take it off the heat and I let it cool overnight. The next morning I wake up walk downstairs and check it out, and this is what it looks like. The top looks burnt, it's just black, and then it gets yellow, and then it gets back to the color white at the bottom. Because of this reason, I don't think it was the PTFE stir bar or an impurity in the solution. What I think it is, is atmospheric air. Even though I stoppered it off, I think that air somehow slipped through and started actually reacting with the sodium ethoxide. The weird thing is, I used argon, actually, to cover up the top before I let it sit overnight. So maybe some of it just diffused in. If you guys think you know what happened, feel free to let me know as I am stumped. But anyways, nonetheless, here is our sodium ethoxide. So uh, next video, we will make acetylacetone. Thank you everybody so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Have a good day.